So aliens, the best story I can come up with, which I think is kind of plausible, is they're here to domesticate us in the same way that we domesticated animals and we domesticated ourselves. That is Robin Hansen. By trade, he's an economist, but that wouldn't be your first guess when you talk to him. In his own words, he's wild in subject matter, not in methods. Any one planet is very unlikely to produce advanced life like ours, but there's a lot of them out there. Okay. Robin cut his teeth researching artificial intelligence, Bayesian statistics, and pioneering prediction markets at Lockheed Martin, NASA, and Xanadu. Today, he's an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. Despite such wild ideas, the core of his work is simple why people behave the way they do, and how they might under different scenarios. At the moment, our children tend to have half as many genes as we do, at least compared to our reference. We can either spend money on ourselves now or on our children a generation later, and therefore, since they only have half our genes, that's only worth half as much. He's the author of two thought-provoking books. The first is called The Elephant in the Brain, a book about signaling. As Robin lays it out for us, we're not being honest or fully understanding about the motives driving us in day-to-day -day life. The story is that your conscious mind is not the king or president of your mind, as you think it is, it's more the press secretary. Its job is to make up excuses for what you do. Evolution decided to hide some motives from you. The second is called The Age of M. M stands for emulation, and the book deals with just that. A future where, as opposed to some advanced AI, we manage to create perfect digital copies of ourselves. He studies the implications of a society with countless digital copies of people and what that means for humans. Recently, what we've done is try to write algorithms, computer software that achieves things that humans can do. Instead, in this context, we're just gonna take a particular human brain and make a model of it. We spoke about grabby aliens, hidden motives, societies, and brain emulations, why medicine may not lead to better health outcomes, what it means for something to be sacred, and other mind-bending ideas. This is the Lavoisier Podcast. Welcome to the new narrative. What's the best argument against the existence of intelligent life in the universe? So the simple view would be that we're the only thing for a very, very long way. Now, there's reasons to think this universe is spatially infinite, in which case there would be, you know, eventually something out there just like this, just by random chance, but it could be a really long way, including not in the observable universe. Um, so in order for that to make sense, we have to not look crazy early, which we kind of do. So you'd have to undercut the reasons why we look early. So let's explain why we look early. Our star will last about 10 billion years, enough, roughly another 5 billion years from here, but life like us will only work for another 1 billion years. So life on Earth had a 5 billion year window in which to appear. The average star lasts 5 trillion years, and advanced life like us is at the end of a process. A bunch of things have to happen before you get to us. So you expect advanced life like us to appear toward the end of the window that life can be on a planet. And you expect it to appear much more likely on a planet that lives a lot longer. Not only that, there's actually a reason why you should expect it to be a power law. So again, the average star lasts a thousand times longer than our star in terms of how long it can host life like ours. And the chance that life should appear on a planet would roughly go as, say, the power of six times that thousand or 10 to the 18. So for having life show up now on a planet like ours is kind of crazy early. So in order to undercut that argument, you have to somehow make those other planets not be eligible. You have to say, well, look, for advanced life to appear, uh, a planet has to be special in certain ways. And you want to pick out the ways in which our planet is special that those long-lived planets are not. So most stars are around much smaller, sorry, most planets are around much smaller stars than ours, small red dwarf stars. Now they have just as many planets as our size, which are just as many in the habitable zone close to the star. That's not a problem. 
but it turns out longer live stars, uh, they have more solar flares. So you have to worry about big solar flares coming and frying the atmosphere. Uh, long lived planets have uh, their continental drift slows down and maybe stops after a while. The internal drive will slow down. And so you could say, ah, those other planets, they couldn't support life later on in their here because uh, either, you know, they, they no longer are eligible because their, you know, continental drift stops or because their flares are too big and they fry the atmosphere. And then if you did that, you say, aha, life can only appear on big stars like ours and therefore we're not crazy early. So that would be the argument you try to give to not make us look crazy early, in which case then it might be plausible that we're the only thing around. Because the main argument that we aren't the only thing around is the data on the clock that we're crazy early. So the assumption here is that we're probably crazy early because as far as we can tell, the chances that any other life should exist are actually pretty high if we're looking at the lifetime of a well, star in another. And then just so any one planet there. is very unlikely to right. produce events like, like ours, but there's a lot but on a massive there. scale. Okay. okay. But okay. it's more about the timing. Mm -hmm. Like you would say, where would do we expect advanced life to appear? And I would say the simple thing is you expect it to appear on a very long lived planet because that got a lot more time for all these steps to happen more chances toward the end of that period. And that means we look crazy early because this uh, is now 14 billion years into the universe. Our star is like four and a half billion years old. The peak of star formation is about 4 billion years after the beginning. But again, the average star will last 5 trillion years. So if we were all in the universe, you'd expect life to appear at the time that was most likely for advanced life to appear on, our, on a planet, which is much later than we are now. So that's the reason to suspect something else is going on. That is, there's a deadline. Now, if there's aliens out there right now, filling up the universe, uh, then there's a deadline. Once they fill everything up, it's too late for new life to appear. And that would be the reason to think that we're this early. We had to be this early, otherwise we wouldn't make the deadline. But that's the reason to think they're out there. Gotcha. And this, this kind of begs the question of, of, I think, a lot of the stuff that you talk about with Gravy Aliens and Fermi's Paradox and the breakdown of quiet and alien life. Why don't we just sort of level set there to okay. set the stage a little bit and then we can, we can take it from there. So aliens, big universe, you look out, you don't see anything. So the first intellectual strategy is to say, what kind of aliens could we see if they were out there? What kind of aliens would be easy to see? And here's the kind of alien that would be easy to see. So it's born on a certain date somewhere out there and it, it becomes advanced, but it reaches a certain point and it's a period where it expands. It expands out into the universe. It just keeps expanding. And when it touches things, it changes them. It does stuff. With them. It doesn't just plant a flag or take a picture, right? It remakes things. This kind of alien you could see. <laughs> that is, if an alien civilization had started somewhere when it's expanding in a big sphere, that sphere would look different. Mm. You would look and you see, ah, that sphere is different than the other places around it because they're doing stuff. We don't know exactly what they'd be doing, but the key idea is they'd be doing something right. in a big way that would just make a big obvious difference. So that's the kind of alien you could see. And therefore, that's the kind of alien you can confront with our observations. The observation that we don't see them, that's the key data point. You might think, well, what does that say? It says a lot. So we have a simple model of where aliens are in space-time. It's got three parameters and each of those parameters is fit to data. So that means we kind of have the values of those parameters and that means we kind of know what the model is. That's, so the simple model of gravity aliens, the kind we could see is they appear at random points in space, they appear at random points in time, but a constant times of power, there's a power law dependence of when they appear in time, and we can go into why, because of the hard steps uh, that they have to go through. And then once they appear at a certain random time, they expand at a certain speed until they meet each other. And that's the whole model. So there's three parameters in this model. One is the speed at which they expand, and the other is the two parameters of this timing model. One is a constant and one is a power. And we can get each of these parameters from data. And the answer is, the parameters are such that they appear roughly once per million galaxies. And then they, the power is roughly a power of six according to time when they appear. 
Our current date is like a random sample from when they appear, so that sets the constant. And they appear then roughly once per million galaxies, and they expand at almost the speed of light within half the factor of two of the speed of light. And that means if we were to soon become gravity, we aren't yet, that'll happen in, say, at least no more than 10 million years. And then we would expand at half the speed of light, and we would meet them in roughly a billion years. And that's the model. So it, just to make sure we have the right definition here, is grabbing is basically just defined as to, you know, whether we go out and colonize another planet? Is it just the act of spreading in general? Right. So a gravity civilization just expands and grabs everything it touches mm -hmm. and changes them. That's, that's the idea. So, I mean, we should drill in on, on some of the parameters in a second, but the larger question in my mind is like, A, why aren't we dead? Um, and, and B, to put it in context, because it seems like there's almost like a, like a Cold War problem here, right? Almost like a first strike doctrine when it comes to intelligent alien life. Um, whereas if you see, you don't necessarily know what their intentions are. And so by default, you should be sort of antagonistic. So in the model I just described, they only have a chance to be antagonistic when they meet each other, mm. when they're at the same place at the same time. And in some sense, that's where my model ends. Mm. That is, when these, these spheres expand and then they finally touch each other, I don't say anything about what happens then because you know maybe one they fight, maybe they don't, maybe one wins, maybe the other, but it doesn't matter. The assumption is something will occupy and control that region still. I don't know who and I don't care for the purposes of this model. We start out with an empty universe and then it slowly fills up and then it's full. And the key question is, when does it start to fill up? How fast does it fill up? And when is it full? And those are the things I'm getting from these parameters. And I'm not really speaking to what happens when they meet. Would it be good news or bad news for us to eventually meet, you know, intelligent alien life? Because in my mind, it almost, it almost assumes that the filter, the hardest step, for instance, is uh, ahead of us rather than behind us. Would that be the case? So um, remember I talked about loud aliens. Yeah. And then there's also quiet aliens. So this three-parameter model I described constrains where the loud aliens are. The model constrains where the loud aliens are in space-time. It doesn't say much about the quiet ones. So then there's this crucial ratio question. How many quiet are there per loud? So we're now quiet. We might become loud. Uh, but what's the ratio? So if it's, say, 1 in 10, then that means we have a 1 in 10 chance, roughly, to become loud. And that means if there's one loud per million galaxies, maybe there's one quiet per 100,000 galaxies, right? So this ratio sets two things. It sets what our chances are to become loud, and it sets how close might the nearest quiet ones be. So when you ask the question, what would it you know, mean to meet aliens, you have to ask, meet the loud or the quiet ones, right? So the loud ones are some, in essence, you would just see them coming from a distance, basically. You would see this huge sphere expanding very rapidly, coming toward you. And you wouldn't get that much warning, but maybe a few million years. <laughs> and that message is, well, when they get here, they will dictate terms unless between now and then you can become as advanced as they. <laughs> so that's a depth, you know, setting a, a quick deadline. It's saying, you've got a million years, get on it, because, uh, you will meet them and now you will try to study them maybe. What can I learn about them? And that will be the question not have they given you much hint about them? They could have sent out messages to warn you about them. They might lie, of course. But with respect to a gravity alien civilization, there'd just be huge in the sky. You'd see this huge thing in the sky that was expanding very rapidly coming towards you. And it may or may not send you messages telling you about them. And but of course, either way, you, you know, you've got a deadline. You can, you can figure out how soon it'll be till they get here. And then you can know that's how long you got, get your act in order. And you know, you also know that they're going to, in total, their civilization is going to be much bigger than yours when you get there, because obviously they're much older than you. At the surface, you might be maybe at a parity, but you know, in terms of the total resources, they're bigger. That's all about a loud one. Now you might ask, what if we met a quiet alien civilization, right? Well, so. Now they aren't this huge civilization expanding into the universe. They're quiet. For, you have to ask first, well, why aren't they loud? Right? That is, how old are they? Now, if, obviously, in principle, they could be only a thousand years old, in which case they're 
nearly as young as we are, but that's crazy unlikely, mm. right? The time coincidence would just be really unusual for them to be really young. So almost surely if you meet any quiet alien civilizations, they're much older than we are. In which case they could have expanded, they could have gone grabby. And now you have to ask, why didn't they? Because that's going to tell you what their agenda is on what their agenda is with you. They didn't go grabby and here they are out here meeting you. Well, why wouldn't they, right? Like, why don't you assume that by default, any civilization that's old enough to do so would become grabby just out of, you know, necessity for long-term survival, right? Well, um, if you talk to ordinary people in our world today and you tell them about the possibility that we could go grabby, you get a lot of criticism. A lot of people don't like that scenario, okay? They might want to oppose it. And here I can give you some reasons why they might. In the last century, our world has gone for a world where basically nations competed with each other and the elites within each nation mainly sort of ranked themselves within a nation and coordinated to support their nation. And now we're in a world where there's kind of a world community of elites who more identify with the world community of elites than they do with their particular nation. And because of that, we have much stronger the global coordination on many things, including many kinds of policy. We saw that with the pandemic. In the pandemic, the usual experts said one thing, and then all the world experts got together and talked a lot for a month or so, and then they all agreed on something different, and then everybody did it that way. And in a lot of other areas in world regulation, we all do it the same way, not because there's a world government, but because there's this world community that agrees on what to do. So for example, Iran is the only country in the world that allows organ sales, and bioethicists all the time are getting together and saying, how are we going to get Iran to stop? They're doing it the wrong way. Everybody else is doing it the right way, and we need everybody to be doing it the right way. And similarly in nuclear energy or airline regulation or other sorts of regulation, we have pretty strong global convergence on how we do many things. Mm. And this global community can not only take credit for global coordination on global issues like global warming, also on reducing war. And war has gone down a lot. And I think global elites can claim some credit for that. So, this will continue into the future. We will get a stronger global community that will together make many decisions and deal with many problems and be proud of their track record of dealing with many problems. Uh, and then there will come this time when it becomes possible to allow an interstellar colonist, colony to leave our system. And if that colony is allowed to leave, that is the end of our civilization's global coordination. That colony goes out somewhere far away it does its own thing, it makes its own policies, it expands and has descendants, and some of those descendants eventually come back here and contest with us. And we can no longer all sit together in the same room and discuss what our policy is, or even all on the same planet typing into our keyboards, what we all want to agree on. So, and some people might say, we like this world. We're in. We like being part of a global community that agrees together, stops war, deals with big global problems, we can't do that if we let anybody leave. So they may say, no, let's not anybody leave. A variation some people have said is, look, once we let people leave, it's too late to, to make any global choices together. So we should wait and have a long reflection, they say. 10,000 years, a million years, what does it matter? We need to sit here and stay together for a long time, really discussing what we wanna do when we leave and not let anybody leave until we've all agreed together on what we want to do. And you can imagine after 10 million years of discussing that, maybe nobody would really be in the mood to let anybody leave. And then, so if we, if we take this way back, right, and we, we sort of think about how this starts in the first place, we sort of are, are doing as much as we can without fundamentally understanding those hard steps that we have to go through for life to emerge, right? Like, I mean, we can talk about how you got to the number about six, but, um, we're sort of, I mean, we're assuming very generally that like, you know, dead stuff kind of has to become the building blocks of life and you eventually have to get to multicellular organisms and intelligent life. Um, but there could, of course, be some like very deep fundamental misunderstanding that, you know, we won't really realize until however many years down the line. Um, given that fact, given there's like so many unknowns at the center there, how did you get to the number six for those hard steps? Okay, so the key idea is, um, Imagine you have a bunch of locks to pick. So it's one of those terrorism movies, like the bomb's <laughs> gonna go off at midnight, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you need to pick a bunch of locks by midnight, otherwise the bomb goes off. 
Now these locks are of different difficulty and you, you can just have to randomly pick each one. And maybe on average, you don't have a very good chance. You're just gonna fail probably, sure. but you gotta sure, try, sure, sure. right? And what if you luck? What if you try? You're lucky and you manage to pick all these locks by the end. And the idea is you have to pick them one at a time before you get to the next one. Well, um, we can say something interesting, which is even though these locks might have had very different difficulties in terms of some having much longer expected time than others, if it turns out that you picked all the locks by the deadline, then what you should see is roughly equal durations between the time it took to pick the locks, even though they were very difficult, and the time you have left over at the end whew, before the deadline is also about the similar duration. So that's a simple statistical derivation. How do we know that the time between picking each lock is the same if these hard steps could be wildly varying in, in difficulty? Right. I, I could show you a little, you know, if I could draw a picture, yeah, I could sure, show you sure, 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 sure. the design. But basically, it's a corner of a high dimensional space, and you have a plane there, and you basically, um, you know, it doesn't really matter the expectation, different directions. It's an even density across this corner plane area, okay. and so that's what sets the same duration. But okay. the key point is, if you happen to get lucky, all the time steps will be similar. So that says the time uh, that in our history, the set of time durations for each of the steps should be roughly the same, at least drawn from roughly the same distribution, as would be the time left between now and when life would no longer be possible. So we actually know how long that is now. There's roughly one billion years left on our planet after four and a half billion years. And we know that the very first step would be some sort of life showing up at all. And that happened roughly 400 million years after the beginning. So we've got two numbers that should have been drawn from the same distribution, 400 million years and 1 billion. And that's where we're going to use to, to estimate six. Basically, because we're saying, you know, how many steps would, can you fit in with roughly that width of a duration in the whole 4.5 billion year thing? So, you know, maybe three to nine steps is not that precise. That's good enough for a rough estimate. Okay, so let's take it all the way back to today. Um, especially over the last couple of years, this has become, I guess, more of a hot topic and yeah. just general population, um, including, what was it, last week? Uh, right. Yeah. Congressional hearing. Congressional hearing. What do we think the odds are of this actually being true? So, as you may know, there's this framework of statistical analysis called Bayesian. And in a Bayesian analysis, uh, which is kind of a standard way to analyze things, when you're trying to figure out the probability of something, you need to do two things. First, you need to figure out a prior. That is, what would you think if you had no evidence? What would it be the chances you'd estimate? And then you have to look at a set of different hypotheses and for each one estimate what we call a likelihood, a fit basically. If that hypothesis were true, how likely would this evidence be? And then what you're supposed to do is for each hypothesis, multiply the prior time the likelihood, then renormalize across all of them, and that will give you your posterior, the chance of the following outcomes. So uh, let's just go for the weird thing. Obviously, there's UFOs. There's a different set of hypotheses to explain UFOs. One of them would be delusions and mistakes. It's just people messing up, misseeing things, being drunk, hallucinating something, right? That's hypothesis one. Number two, hoax. <laughs> Somebody is systematically trying to make you think that there's stuff there, maybe paying people to lie, making up pictures, whatever, right? That's a second category. That could explain UFOs. A third category is, well, there's really, there really are these objects and they really do have these amazing abilities and they're from somewhere around here. Some secret Earth organization has making these things and it's an amazing ability compared to what we thought people had, but somebody around here has these abilities. And the fourth hypothesis is, well, they're not from around here and these things are real, okay? These are the four categories of hypotheses. So to do a full analysis, what we need to do is for each one, figure out a prior, say, if I had no evidence of UFOs, what would the chances I would guess of that sort of thing happening be? And then we need a likelihood. How well does the actual data we see fit that particular story? Now, I'm not an expert on all eight of those numbers, okay? <laughs> So there's eight numbers we need here, basically. Yeah. Each one has a prior, each one has a likelihood. Yep. We need eight numbers and then we can get the full analysis. But I am more of an expert on some of the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I should speak to the numbers I'm an expert on and not to the other ones. Fair okay? enough. Now, so, now first of all, the, the, the mistakes and delusions thing, I could say I've looked at the evidence enough to think 
that's not a high likelihood for some of the most extreme cases. I'm not buying that this is just an honest mistake. But the other hypotheses are still on the table. Okay. Now, with respect to the hypotheses, I got to say, well, let's see. The hoax thing, well, I mean, people do do hoaxes and say even the US government has famously had some pretty big hoaxes during wartime and even not during wartime. So I got to say, well, yeah, there's, there's a decent chance that somebody could do these hoaxes. The biggest problem with that is say the Soviet Union apparently has a similar set of history of these things. Could the same hoax be behind the things they saw in the Soviet Union and the things they saw in the US? I mean, which, who's, is there, are they coordinating on a hoax? I mean, that's a little harder to see. Okay, even China has some reports of these things. Now, maybe they made up the reports as part of a hoax. I don't know, but okay. But so I gotta give hoax the highest prior probability here. Like, you know, but you go, okay, yeah, but what about the hidden earth organizations? And I go, we know enough about earth organizations. It's really hard to see how an organization that skilled could hide that well, like for that long. Um, that's just hard to see. I can't give that a very high prior. I can give the hope. I mean, so obviously the delusions has a really high prior, right? Yeah, people are deluded all the time. Duh. I mean, just, yes, of course, delusions has a really high prior. The question is, how well can it explain, say, the most extreme cases? And I go, the likelihood there just looks kind of low for the, for the most extreme cases. Um, then we've got the hoax. And I go, yeah, hoax has a pretty high prior. Would this look... You know, so the, the main problem with the likelihood of the hoax is this, yeah, the Soviet Union and the US also seeing the same stuff. What kind of a hoax scenario can I come up with where that plays out? And I have trouble with that, but still, I got, I honestly, I'm going to have to say it's still pretty high as a posterior, right? Okay. Yeah. There's a big hoax going on out there. Somebody wants us to believe, and we can talk about why if you want, what would their motives be? Well, why make a big hoax like this? And then. Then we've got the aliens thing. So I'm kind of an expert on aliens. I got this model of aliens in the universe. So it does fall to me to say, okay, what would be the prior probability, Robin, <laughs> that there would be aliens out there and they would be visiting us now and they would be kind of looking the way these ones do. And I feel like, okay, I got to do that calculation. It's kind of my job. And the point is to like collect the numbers along the way, like to give an accounting because I need to give a number, a prior mm. probability for that. So I have to like add assumptions, the best assumptions I can, but for each one, I've got to account for how much is that costing right, me right. in the prior here. Right. And then I've got to have an answer at the end. I would say, this is the most likely scenario I can come up with. This is how much it cost me in terms of the assumptions I had to make. And then that's my prior. That's what you've got to fold into the data, which I'm not an expert on, but I got to say, uh, you know, if it's high enough, you got to look at it, right? Okay. So first of all, we have these grabby aliens, right? But you know, the nearest one is a million galaxies away or whatever. It's like, like the chance that they would be right here right now is just doesn't fit the story at all, right? So grabby, they aren't grabby aliens. If there's UFOs, aliens nearby, they're not grabby. How, who could they be? So the best story I can come up with is panspermia siblings. I say, there's a plausible story that life didn't start on earth. It came to earth from somewhere else. Uh, there was some planet Eden before, maybe it was born at the peak of say 4 billion years after the beginning of the big bang. Uh, and then life evolved on that planet for a long time. And then some rock smashed into that planet, kicked up another rock off that planet. Inside that rock was life in that planet that drifted through the stars and that rock seeded our stellar nursery. So stars are formed in nurseries where thousands of stars are formed all together at once. It does seem that our stellar nursery was unusually large actually maybe 10,000 planets, stars all at once. And in a stellar nursery, it's really dense. There's rocks flying back all the force. The stars are all really close to each other. So if life seeds any one of those stars, it's going to seed a lot of the rest of them because rocks are just flying around. So Panspermia seeded our stellar nursery. It seeded a lot of planets in that nursery. And then basically all those stars drifted apart and they're now in a ring around the galaxy some of them thousands of light years away. And one of those other planets could have reached our level first for us. That would be the panspermia sibling aliens. Okay. So I've got to say, okay, we, I've got to give you a prior, like one in 10 or one in a hundred that 
you know, panspermia siblings exist and that one of them reached our level before us. Okay. But given that I make that assumption, it's clear they didn't go gravity because mm. the estimated time when they would have reached our level would be say hundred million years or longer ago. So they would have had plenty of time to take over this galaxy and go farther if they had wanted to. So clearly they didn't, right? So we got to postulate that panspermia siblings have this policy against expansion. <laughs> they somehow prevented any part of their civilization from going out and colonizing the galaxy because otherwise our galaxy would look really different. So we know basically given that they're there, that they have this policy against expansion. They chose to be quiet and they have a policy to be quiet. And it's actually quite impressive for a hundred million years, at least they successfully implemented this policy. That is they prevented any part of themselves from sneaking off and colonizing the universe. That, that's pretty impressive. So they obviously have a pretty strict and well-enforced, successfully enforced policy for a hundred million years. And this clearly can't be allowing a lot of vacation trips from home, right? They, they have to mostly be shutting down most all travel from this place in order to successfully implement this policy for a hundred million years. So coming here is an exception here, right? You got to see that. If they're really this anal about preventing anybody from expanding and yet they're here now, they may allow a pretty big exception from the usual policy for this particular mm. expedition. So there's something important at stake here. Mm. Okay. And there's the obvious thing we can see that's at stake is we're at risk of violating the rule. In a relatively short time, we could be at the level of going out and expanding. And then if we do that, we have un undone the purpose of their rule, right? And so that's their reason for being here. So all of those follow pretty directly from them being panspermia siblings, right? If they're panspermia siblings, then they have a rule against the expansion. But if they're here now, then clearly they have a reason for that big exception. And the obvious reason is to keep us from expanding. So we've, we've got some parts of this key scenario we need, but we don't have all of it yet because now we need to explain, okay, they're here, but they're doing this kind of weird thing where they could be completely obvious, show up, build pillars, and like make big announcements. Hey, we're here. We have a message for you. Here's the rules. They could have done that. Mm. Or they could have been completely invisible. A hundred million years more advanced than us. They could say up in dark satellites far away and we would never notice a thing. Right? And they could watch everything we do very, with high resolution and no problem. So they're not doing these two things. So we need an explanation for why they're doing this third thing. The third thing is what? Hanging out at the edge of visibility, not being too clear, but not being invisible. What's with that? So we have to come up uh, and we're going to have to create a hypothesis to explain that. And it's going to have to lower the probability of our prior because, you know, we need to explain that. So the sort of thesis here is that if they're here, they're not grabby. And there's this kind of doctrine, whether it's self-enforced or not, um, that going grabby is like a no-no. And you're assuming as well that if aliens are here, that they're so far advanced that they're sort of being slightly detectable intentionally is kind of what we're talking we about. We have here. to assume that is they would be quite capable of doing other things. So this must be on, on purpose somehow. Okay. And so now we got to explain why. Right. So the best story I can come up with, which I think is kind of plausible is, um, they're here to domesticate us in the same way that we domesticated animals and we domesticated ourselves. How do we domesticate ourselves or other animals? Our standard story is that social species have a status hierarchy. You domesticate a social species species by slipping into the top of their status hierarchy. You show up, you're visible, you're with them, you're there and you're better. Hmm. That's how we domesticate dogs and horses and other social animals in our world. We're there, we're at the top of their hierarchy. We show we're better and then they defer to us. And that's how we domesticate each other. That's how an emperor domesticates the empire, right? They have the bigger crown, the bigger palace, the bigger army, they're better. And everybody goes, okay, yeah, you're at the top. You're better. We'll do what you say. Right? So this is how humans have domesticated humans, how humans domesticate animals. We could postulate this is kind of a universal phenomenon. Social species domesticate other ones by slipping at the top of their status hierarchy. So then the simple strat. So remember the constraints here, they have a home world. They almost never let anybody leave. They're really scared of anybody leaving yet. They have to authorize this expedition to come here far away 
and domesticate us or, or do something, right? It has to be a strategy they can approve from the home world, and they're only going to send resources and authorization as necessary to implement this policy. They're not going to give them a lot of discretion because that risks them going rogue. Yeah. Okay. So they had to have a strategy right from the beginning. They said, this simple strategy is what we're going to do. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but this is what we're going to try. And obviously, they got to have a button, right? They're going to try something, and if it doesn't work, they have a fallback. Some way they push a button, and we're no longer a problem, right? Certainly, that would be well within their abilities, so surely they would have that at the end of their strategy, right? So they're going to try something. And if it doesn't work, they're going to push the button. But what are they going to try? They have to pick a very simple thing to try from home world. They say, try this. We get why that would work. Here's how you would do it. Or we all approve. We send you the resources to do that. And that's it. So our simple strategy would be domestication. So the simple strategy is just hang out around us, look really impressive. That's it. And peaceful, of course. Don't look too hostile. You can be somewhat hostile in retaliation, maybe, but you know, mostly you're peaceful. You're there, you're impressive. Now you might think, well, couldn't you do that and be a lot more visible? Well, now we have the problem. Say, humans on Earth are pretty similar to other humans, right? But we often hate each other for pretty small differences, right? We find ways to find foreigners and find some little thing and go, that's just evil, that's just yeah. terrible, right? And that's with other humans. So that's often an obstacle to humans domesticating other people around the planet because we resist these other humans who seem a little too different. These are actual aliens. So there's much more likely to something about them that we actually hate if we were to know about it. Maybe they eat babies, who knows? I mean, they don't think that's a problem, but we do, right? So they've realized that if they were to sit here and sit down with us and tell us their whole story, we're gonna hate something about it. Just, just we're gonna really hate something about it. And the whole domestication thing gets undone because we all tell each other, ooh, there's this one thing we hate and that's it, right? So that's why they can't sit down and just tell us their whole story. So the simple strategy is tell us hardly anything. Just be there, be impressive, make it clear you're there, make it clear you're peaceful and impressive, and that's it. And in fact, this does seem to kind of work in the sense that people who believe in UFOs or aliens, this is kind of their story about aliens. They're better than us, they're more peaceful, they have a better agenda for protecting the environment or whatever it is, we should listen to them, we should follow their lead. This is in fact what people who think UFOs or aliens tend to say. So it seems to be working on them. The problem is the rest of the people don't believe it yet, but you know, they only need this to work when we're finally able to expand into the universe, right? They don't need us to do anything before then because we're not a threat to them before then. So they're in no particular rush. This could still be centuries away before we're capable of expanding into the universe. So, you know, they, they can be patient. They can just wait us out. And as long as by the time we can expand the universe, at that point we're convinced they exist, then it's done its job. I could sit here and ask you questions about this for eight <laughs> hours, but there's, there's, I think, a nice kind of segue here. You're talking a lot about uh, hierarchies and social creatures. I think this is a nice segue into what you talk about in the elephant in the brain, this idea of signaling, this idea of, oh, I'm better than you for you know X, Y, or Z reason, um, and a lot of the sort of day-to-day -day things that you go into in the book. I, why don't we, again, just sort of take a level set to talk about okay. the larger thesis of the book, what is signaling, uh, what is the elephant in the brain, and how does this sort of uh, occur naturally in day-to-day -day life for humans? I'm an economics professor. <laughs> One of the things I discovered upon learning economics is there's a bunch of weird stuff people do that economists and other social scientists scratch their heads and go, what? <laughs> So we have a bunch of standard theories about what people are doing and why, and then there's a bunch of weird things people do. And I, like other social scientists, ponder these weird things people do. And I came to realize that a simple way to make sense of a lot of what weird people do, the weird things people do, is to say, well, they're actually trying, they have a different agenda, a different motive than, than you thought. And I realized once you're willing to postulate other motives for common behaviors, you can explain a lot of them. A lot better. That's the key idea here. So our book is called The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. And so the first third goes over why you might not be aware of your motives, why you might be wrong about your motives, making that plausible to you. But then the last two thirds is going over 10 different areas of life, showing you in each era, show, excuse me, showing you in each area what you think your motive is, the standard story, why that's a bit puzzling and doesn't make a lot of sense, 
and then how there's another motive we could postulate that you actually have that you're not so aware of, and how that can make more sense of your behaviors. And so these 10 areas, we go over conversation and art and um, charity and politics and religion and medicine and education and a, lot, you know, a bunch of different areas of life and in, in consumption, I guess. And each of them, we say, we can understand your behavior. It makes a lot more sense if we just postulate that your motive isn't quite what you say it is. So to give you an example, I, I recently talked to my colleague, Brian Kaplan, who has a book, The Case Against Education. And so the chapter is cribbed from this book. Basically, why do you go to school? And you usually say, to learn the material, to learn useful things that I will make me a better employee and citizen. And with respect to that theory of education, there's a bunch of things that don't make sense about education, including the fact that you hardly learn anything. You don't remember much of what you learned. Um, and that we still pay you more for more education, even if, you, even if it's not useful in your job. Those are a bunch of puzzles that don't make sense from this simple motive point of view. And then we say, ah, what if your reason for going to school is just to show off how smart and conformist and conscientious you are? That works as an explanation for behavior. If that were the reason for behavior, you, it would explain these various things that were puzzling from the other point of view. It would make sense to have this motive. It would make sense to do it for this reason. But apparently you're just not aware that this is your reason. So again, we have 10 chapters, each of which we do this. And the, the meta question should be, well, why don't we know? Why are we so wrong about our motives? Because each of the motives we actually have, according to our story, is a reasonable motive to have. Some of them are actually laudable, admirable, but we tend to deny them. So the story is that your conscious mind is not the king or president of your mind, as you think it is. It's more the press secretary. Its job is to make up excuses for what you do, to give defendable stories for what you do. And so the idea is your true motives put you more at risk of being accused of bad things. The motives that you offer instead are more defendable motives. They are more motives that it'll be harder for people to accuse you of bad things if that's your motive. So that's right. Mm -hmm. Your PR head of your mind makes up stories about why you do things to make it, to make it easier to defend you against accusations for bad things. So if we're talking about this and actually context of what you were talking about earlier, you mentioned that a lot of a lot of your job, for better or worse, is at least trying to assign a number or probability to something. When you think about human behavior in general and signaling in general, how much of human behavior do you think is signaling? How much of that do you think is conscious? How much of that do you think is subconscious um, right. generally? So the key thing first is to notice that there are many layers of causation and explanation of behavior. So when you do something, the moment before you did it, there were some thoughts in your head. And maybe in the five minutes before that, there were other thoughts in your head that were sure. related to this thing you did. So those would be more your conscious motives, the motives you're aware of, what was in your head just before you did it. But before those five minutes, you had a whole history. Your species had a longer history. The universe has had a longer history. A lot of causal factors have come into shaping what you were in that moment to make you inclined to do the things you did. So. Our book is more focused on that larger causal structure. We say, look, you go to school. Why do you go to school? And we have to be thinking, where did school come from? When did school appear? What are the social forces that shaped school and made it the way it is? The social forces that made you the sort of person inclined to go to school, that made your parents push you to go to school, that made your teachers tell you you should go to school. You had a whole world around you that was pushing you to go to school, that was telling you it was a good idea, that was shaping what your expectations were for and what things you expected to get out of it. And that whole world isn't the same as what was in your head just before you did it. So that's what we're trying to explain more fundamentally. What are these larger forces that were shaping your behavior? And um, if you ask when somebody does something, it makes other people think more or less of them. How much is their larger Cause it, the causal process that shapes their behavior, taking into account the fact that they will look better or worse as a result of what they do. That's what I mean by signaling. <laughs> when I say behavior is signaling, I mean that the expectation about whether it would make you look better or worse 
was influencing the choice. It didn't have to influence it through your thoughts the moment before, but it could influence the larger expectations of the world, what people were rewarded for, what they tended to prosper if they did, what your parents you know, feel that would be good for you, what they would push you to do, what stories they would have heard about whether it's successful things to do. All of those, I think, are pretty strongly influenced by wider expectations about what looks good. Mm. And so certainly in our world, people look good for going to school. People who go to school are praised and they are seen as impressive and they are seen as people you want to associate with and you want to hire and you want to marry, et cetera. So when I say school is a lot about signaling, I mean that people have accounted and taken that into account a lot in choosing their habits towards school. The fact that it looks good has greatly influenced their inclination to go to school. That's what I mean by saying signaling is a big part of school. And so now I ask, what fraction of other behavior you ask is substantially influenced by, the, by how it makes you look? And, and I'm going to say an awful lot of it, yeah, 90% maybe, of what we do is substantially influenced by how it makes you look. What neighborhoods you live in, what sport hobbies you have, what books you read, you know, how you comb your hair, what clothes you buy, what food you serve. I think if you think about it for just a moment, you realize, yeah, if you have some expectation that a certain kind of food you could serve to your friends would make you look better, and another kind of food you could serve would make you look doofy or out of it or clueless or mean, that will influence what food you serve the people around you. Yes, you will, your expectations about how it will make you look will influence what you do. And yes, I'll, <laughs> that's a big part of human behavior, is doing the things that we expect will make us look better and avoiding the things we expect will make us look worse. So we're talking about this on an individual level. What if we sort of get lots of different people together, right? Like, do you see any kind of similar behavior in organizations, companies, countries, multinationally, and as a species as a whole even? I mean, we were talking about aliens earlier. Does that change things at all? So think about the incentives to promote sports, sure. okay? Or the arts, right? dance, perhaps. So at an individual level, you could say, well, I want to look better. So I'm going to get into sports or dance because it'll take a lot of time that I don't have and, you know, money that I don't have, but it'll make me look good. And we might realize, okay, that makes sense at an individual level, but at a social level, it's kind of a waste. The more we let people get into sports and dance, the more, well, you know, other things won't happen. And we might think it would be a good idea to tax those things. We should be discouraging people a bit on the margin from doing all this wasteful signaling about sports and dancing. And that on a modest social level, a town level, we would want to tax sports and dance. But you think, well, our town wants to look good to the other towns, right? So we have to ask if we subsidize instead of tax our sports, then we might win the state championship and everybody will be impressed by our town and they'll want to come to our town and marry our town and hire people from our town because they'll remember we won the state championship. So now when our town is trying to look good to other towns, you can see we're going to subsidize instead of taxing these things that are in a sense a collective waste. And this is going to be true for the state level too, right? Should the state subsidize sports overall for the whole state? Well, you can see how it's going to cause this race among all the towns in the state to look best. That's a bit of a waste, but don't we want our state to look well? to all those other states and the rest of the nations in the world. So you can see how collective signaling usually means that instead of countering wasteful signaling at the individual level, we, we pile on and double down and do more. What kind of signaling is this? You coming on a podcast, me coming over here with a bunch of cameras and some lights. It should be easy for you to figure this out. All you have to ask is, how does it make you or I look different if we're on the podcast or not, or if we do the podcast one way or another way, right? Ask yourself, you know, if somebody saw this podcast and they say, hey, that was pretty interesting, you should listen to the podcast, how would our reputations change? How would people's opinions of us change? That's the whole mechanism here. So this isn't some hidden thing that you need some expert to figure out for you. You should be able to just directly inspect what, how does doing this sort of thing in one way or another change people's impressions of these people? And that's the signaling process people are trying to get, they're trying to look better. I could look better, you could look better if we do this certain kinds of ways. Mm. And then you could ask what kind of appearance 
could we generate that would make people like us better, respect us more? Sure. That's the whole story. What's your favorite of, I think it was the 10 that you covered in the book, or maybe what was the most surprising to you, the one you sort of enjoy thinking about the most? Well, the medicine one is certainly one that's most surprising to readers. And in fact, they often find it hard to believe. In fact, when I first came here to the economics department at George Mason, many of my colleagues find it hard to believe. Uh, they initially had me teaching health economics and they weren't so sure I should be teaching health <laughs> economics because I was telling people this pretty odd view about medicine. Uh, which I think they've later come to accept is, in fact, the standard view among those who know the data. But it still looks a little weird to say that the standard story about medicine is, as you probably know, <laughs> we have this capacity to get sick or injured. There are these specialists, doctors, who have this ability to mitigate the damages that can come from being sick or injured, but they're expensive and we need to judge their quality. So we have insurance to pay for their expense and we have regulation to uh, you know, control air quality, and then we can all get the value of this medicine that helps us get less sick and injured, right? Nice, simple story we all have about medicine. Problem is, there's a bunch of things that don't make sense from this point of view. The most dramatic one is that, in fact, we have a bunch of randomized experiments where we randomly gave some people more medicine than others, and the people we gave more medicine to were not healthier. Overall, People getting more medicine doesn't make them healthier. They don't live longer. They are less sick. There's not a connection. That's a pretty big challenge to the view that the reason we have medicine is to avoid being sick and injured because on average, they're not actually healthier. Now, that's gotta be pretty surprising to most people. I mean, to put that in context though, so if we're talking about, obviously if I you know, get in an accident, I go to the hospital, me going to the ER is, for me individually, probably going to lead to a better outcome than if I had just sort of stayed in the car and been sitting there. Right. So, so if you think of medicine as composed of many different treatments yeah. and you think some of the treatments are helpful and some of the treatments do nothing, then you'll have a puzzle and you're saying, well, if we average treatments to do nothing with treatments that are helpful, surely we'll get helpful on average. It'll just be less helpful if there's more dud treatments and you're missing the third category. There are treatments that hurt. There are many medical treatments that hurt. I mean, in fact, a standard estimate of how many people in the USA die every year from mistakes in hospitals and doctors is 100,000. So one of the leading causes of death. So medicine doesn't just sometimes help, sometimes not. Sometimes it hurts. And in fact, it hurts so often that on average, when you get more medicine, you're not healthier. So yes, you go to the ER with a gunshot or a car accident, that might be good, but that has to be balanced against other things they'll do that will be worse. When we think about, uh, you know, survival rates or, or, you know, general lifespan across any different country, is the U.S. or maybe Japan having a higher, you know, uh, average lifespan than some other country? Do you attribute that mostly to being able to make less mistakes? Or is that more of a lifestyle thing? Lifespans have increased over the last few centuries and rich countries tend to live longer. And there's a time trajectory, how that's happened over history. And we have a number of causal factors we could try to attribute increasing lifespans to. One would be increased medicine of different sorts, say the kind that helps, the kind that hurts. But there's also sanitation, nutrition, accidents, uh, even stress. These are all other causal factors that can influence health. So the first thing to know is the medical factor we know is a small effect. We, we, we look pretty carefully at that. Not only does medicine not help on average, but medicine hasn't been that big a part. It might be some part, but not a very big part of why we live longer. Now, what about these other ones? Nutrition, sanitation, say? Well, if you look at the story of when nutrition got better, like when, you know, what times and places, or the story about when sanitation got better, these are not steady stories. These are stories where there were some pretty big improvements at particular points in time, and then other periods where it hasn't improved much. So for example, nutrition and sanitation haven't actually improved that much for the last half century in say the United States. We had pretty good nutrition and pretty good sanitation half a century ago. But the fact is that the rate at which lifespans have increased is best taken out in terms of what call we age specific mortality. For each age, there's a rate at which those people die. And typically, 
when you're 10 years older, you die twice as much. So there's a really big age effect on mortality. But age-specific mortality has been falling over time. And that's sort of the most direct measure of health getting better. And remarkably, age-specific mortality has fallen relatively steady for a whole century. And it mostly ignores these big events we saw in medicine and sanitation and nutrition. So it's actually puzzling why we're getting you know, less death over time. We don't actually know, but I might attribute it best to stress. So we know that um, when you suffer more stressful life events, that is you interpret as stressful, that your body has what's called a stress response, which tends to turn off your growth and immune systems temporarily, and that makes you sicker and die faster. And richer people tend to invoke the stress response less because their lives are less stressful. And that's, in my mind, a big plausible explanation for why we're living longer as we're richer is that we invoke the stress response plans. And there's a multiplier effect for contagion there. Mm. That is, if you get healthier and then you don't catch something, then I don't catch it from you. So that would be my best guess for what's explaining this long-term steady trend in age-specific mortality, which is largely ignored big sudden shifts in um, medicine or sanitation or uh, nutrition. Mm. Now, in the last decade or so, in the United States in particular, we are seeing a substantial deviation from previous trends in terms of drugs. Uh, overdose, drug overdoses are have been doubling every 10 years at a pretty steady rate for the last 50 years, and now are at such a high rate that they are cutting into our lifespans. Lifespans are no longer increasing in the US, they are decreasing substantially due to drug overdoses. So that's also not any of these other factors. You know, what's causing drug overdoses is a hard thing, but again, it's not medicine, it's not nutrition, it's not sanitation. It's not even stress, obviously. To shift away from medicine for a minute, I'm curious on the topic of signaling, what you think about this idea of taste, right? I don't mean literal taste, right. but like for music, for art, for fine dining or luxury goods. Do you think that taste is a thing that actually you know, exists or is this just purely a function of signaling? Signaling is real. <laughs> it's not a label you give to things that aren't real. So I resist this categorization of signaling and real stuff. So the whole point of signaling is that you show a real feature that you have. Yes. If, you, if, you, if, you're, if you say signaling your intelligence, it's working because you actually are smarter. And by signaling your intelligence, you're convincing people of your actual difference in intelligence. So we do signal taste, mm. but that's because taste is real, mm. not because it's made up. Mm. Right. So in our, I guess the real question here is like, when we're talking about taste, is taste as a concept real in the sense that there is inherent value to it? Or is it real in the sense that we call it taste, but in reality, it's us trying to project some kind of superiority for I those. think what you really mean to ask is yeah. how socially conditional is it? Sure. Or even socially constructed. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So for example, you know, in some places they wear some kind of clothes, in other places a different kind of clothes and at different times. So there's certainly, in terms of what kind of clothes look good on people or that they will be praised, there's a degree of social conditionality, i.e. social context matters. That doesn't mean it isn't real. It just means that it depends on context, mm -hmm. okay? It means that what people want in your clothes isn't just some objective fact about the clothes independent of context. They want you to be well-matched to your context. That's part of what they want you to show in signaling your taste, not just that you have some abstract taste that could have been encoded in your genes a million years ago and would still be valid today, independent of context. They want you to show that you have taken your fundamental characteristics and matched them to the world around you and produced a taste that pays attention to both of those things. You are not only able to like use your eyes and mind to look at you know, things that are smooth and things that are elegant and things that are integrated, et cetera, but they also want you to be following your culture, to be part of your culture and to have be aware of what your culture locally prefers. Mm. That's part of what they want from you. That is, that is the idea is you're signaling attraction, features that will be attractive to other people, that they will want to associate with you. 
One of the things they want to see in you is that you aren't clueless about the world you're in. Right, right. Okay. They want you to not only not be clueless about the world, they like you to be very aware of the world, sensitive to it, interpreting it intelligently, well-connected, well-respected by the world. They want you to have a connection to the world you're in, and they want you to show that. And that's one of the things they're trying to get out of your signals, is to believe credible signals of your not only innate abilities that would be true anywhere, but your local abilities that are true in this particular world and that make you a good match for this world you're in. So in examining any of these like facets of life with a microscope um, and sort of uncovering these hidden truths and like sort of the day-to-day -day behaviors of people, um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear, is, is this like hyper-rationality actually not a net positive in society? Is signaling not necessarily something that fortunately or unfortunately is, is necessary for human civilization to actually exist and function well day to day. So we economists think in terms of the concept of game theoretic equilibria. That is, in a game theoretic equilibria, each person is looking at everything they know and all the options they have, and they're taking their best action given the goals they have and the information and the options available to them. That's what a game theoretic equilibrium is. Now, game the theoretic equilibria can be lamentable in the sense that if we were to change the game, maybe everybody would be better off. Mm. And we want often to look for ways we might change the game to make everybody better off. And often we can find such things. Um, so in the case of signaling, the question is, first, are people roughly doing what's best for them, given their options and their information and the goals? And I got to presume roughly, on average, they are roughly doing the right thing for themselves. Next question is, could we change the game somehow to make everybody better off? And that we discussed in the context of, say, regulating sports. We might say, OK, if we're all investing too much in sports, then that's a bit of a waste. If we tax sports, we could all be better off, except for the fact that now our town or our state, et cetera, would look worth the world. So then it looks like, okay, maybe we can't solve this problem at a local level. We would need some sort of global change to tax sports or something in order to make that work. If we can't make a global deal to tax sports, local taxes are not an improvement. Um, so that's about whether signaling is a good idea or not. Now, I thought you might have been asking about our awareness of this whole process, this whole analysis I'm doing here and that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. Is it a good idea to do this analysis? <laughs> now, first of all, if nobody does this analysis, nobody could recommend what policies might be better so that we could be better off. So somebody, it would seem, needs to do this, at least if anybody's ever going to listen to their suggestions. Now, if we all know that nobody's ever going to listen to their suggestions anyway, maybe that's a lost cause. We should skip it. But I might say, if you're a social scientist, if you're a policy analyst or a social scientist or someone who's job it is to figure out how the world works and tell people about it, then your job is to figure out how it works, even if it's not pretty. And, and this is that. That's what this is. Okay. Now, what if your job isn't to be a social scientist or policy analyst? What if your job is just to live the world? Then according to the analysis we've just done, evolution decided not to tell you about some stuff. It, in fact, made it you know, opaque to you and, in fact, misled you about some stuff. And it thought that was in your interest. Evolution decided that there were some things you were better off not knowing. Mm. Maybe even some things you were better off being misled about. That's the elephant in the brain. That's the, the hidden motives. Evolution decided to hide some motives from you. And on the presumption that you were better off not knowing those things, that not knowing those things would let you pretend other things more effectively, more genuinely, more authentically. And you would just be ignorant and wrong, but at least not a malicious liar. Okay, so now the question is, if you're this ordinary person who inherited evolution's habit for not understanding some things, should you read my book, <laughs> listen to this podcast, and learn otherwise? Is that good for you? Well, we have to admit that if evolution was right about you, if it you know, made these judgments in a context that still applies roughly today, then yeah, you should know. You were made to be ignorant, and uh, I would be doing you a disservice to uh, disabuse you of your comfortable ignorance. Um, 
So then we have, want to identify who are the exceptions. For whom should they know the truth? For whom is knowing the truth better? Mm. Now, for example, you could be just the sort of person who just, who just wants to know the truth, period. I mean, let, may, if the heavens may fall, and fine, if that's you, then <laughs> this book's for you. But who else? Um, there's these social scientists and policy analysts. Their job is to figure out how the world actually works in order to make it better, so they better know what's going on. So they're on Team Read the Book. Who else? Uh, well, your job might be unusually dependent on understanding how people actually are compared to how people say they are. So you might be a manager or a salesperson, and your whole career may depend on actually guessing correctly how people respond to some things. Not how they say they'll respond, or how they believe they'll respond, but how they actually respond. In which case, you may need to actually hold your nose and figure out what people are really like, because that's your job. Finally, the last category of people for whom it might make sense to learn these truths are people who are nerdy, socially unskilled. See, for most people, their intuition tells them roughly what to do, and they glide through the social world effective and smooth and accomplishing things, even though their actions are at odds with the thoughts in their head. <laughs> they believe some things about what they're doing and their motives, and then they do other things, but the stuff they do just works, okay? Because they're, they're socially effective, they're smooth, they're competent. Then there are some people, like sort of me, maybe, <laughs> who are just not so competent. When you do the things that come natural to you, it just doesn't work so well. <laughs> Maybe you've got a smart head who could think about things, but you haven't been using that head to figure things out, and you've just been following your instincts, and your instincts are crap. So for you, it might be worth thinking about some of these things, because you're, if your instincts haven't been working, the, the world isn't smooth for you, the things you naturally do just fumble and fall apart, and the world says, what the hell, you know, stop that, why are you doing these things? Then for you, maybe you should abstractly understand how things are going so that you can get, well, this is why the world wants these things from you and be more conscious about it. Yes, that will come at some cost, but for you, those costs may be worth it. Okay, I want us to take a couple steps back and, and sort of shift gears for a minute. We'll get into the age of M and I want you to talk all about the book and, and sort of the thesis and everything here, but first I wanna talk about predicting the future. Um, you know, in the book, you give the example of successful forecasts in the future cost changes for devices like batteries or solar cells. Um, and you sort of show that, uh, I guess, predictions of the future are often more accurate when aggregated than random, but individually, it's like kind of all over the place. My question to you is, A, how do you accurately predict the future? And B, is trying to predict the future with any real level of fidelity kind of just futile? I think many people make the claim that it's basically impossible to break the future. And on the basis of this claim, they therefore claim that there's no point in trying to think about it. And even that whatever forecasts they're making are the best that are possible. So for example, if they like science fiction, they say science fiction is the best that you can do. So, you know, don't even try. Now, it's obvious that we can and do successfully predict the future on the short time scale of our personal lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you go to work in the morning, you come home at nine, and you're making actions sure. on the basis of many predictions that are roughly right sure. about your world. Uh, so the really only question is here is how rapidly does the accuracy of predictions fall as the time scale increases or the social scope increases or things like that, right? So clearly it does get harder to predict the future as the time gets longer, but it gets easier to predict the future as you aggregate over more different things. Um, that is, uh, you know, overall trends tend to be steadier than any one person's thing. So we, we should look at long-term trends. And long-term trends are one of the most common ways that people try to predict the future. And then in that case, however long a trend's been continuing in the past gives you a rough guess about how long you should expect it in the future. So I just said uh, age-specific, I'm mean, sorry, um, drug deaths have been doubling every 10 years for the last 50 years. Well, you might think, okay, Yes, for the next 25 years, that'll probably continue, right? That's half the scale of which they even continue before. So we have a lot of trends like that, and we do predict the future of the trends, and that works if you get it roughly right. Then in addition to trends, we have sort of fundamental theory. Things we understand about how the world works, and we can use that to make predictions. You know, so for example, people predicted that, hey, there's only so much oil on the ground, eventually you run out of it, and so 
trends of oil use got to reach eventually some limit where, you know, you'll, it'll cut back because you run out, right? We do a lot of those sorts of fundamental theory-based predictions, and they do work. Um, so uh, one kind of futurism that is popular is a tech-based future, where people just try to guess which techs will show up eventually, right? And that actually has success succeeded. People have roughly guessed, say, that cell phones would show up, or ele you know, electric planes will show up, or self-driving cars, or you know, et cetera. People have not only looked at trends, but basic possibility of technology, and they say, ah, see, this possibility will eventually appear. These parts all have to get cheap enough, and then that thing will show up. And I've known a great many successful predictions of that form. The harder, it's hard to predict exactly when they'll show up, but easier to predict, well, eventually, sure, there'll be cell phones. You just have to wait till the electronics get small sure. enough, you know, cheap enough, and then people will be able to do that sort of thing, right? Um, the kind of prediction that I'm doing in my book, The Age of M, is where you take a particular technology prediction and then you try to predict its social consequences. So that's not really going to be trend-based because the technology hasn't shown up. That has to be more theory-based. It has to be based on our understanding of how society works. I think that has often worked. People have often been able to predict social changes from technologies. Uh, There's just a question of how far you can go with that. So People have tended to say, well, you can make some modest short-term predictions about the consequences of technologies, but the farther you get away, the harder it's going to be and quickly you run out. Okay? So my book, The Age of M, was trying to prove you could go farther. So I took a very particular technology that's been long forecast that something that will come. I do believe it will come. And then tried to ask how many predictions could I make about what the world with that technology would be like. And my Attempt was to give you so many predictions that I would change your mind about how many predictions are possible. Mm. So I basically describe how this one technology, which is very potent and very you know, influential, would radically change society. And yet I could tell you a great many details about that new society, trying to overcome the story that, well, once things change a substantial amount, who knows what could possibly happen. I'm trying to disprove that. I say, you know, we, we can figure out what could possibly happen. Now, I'm not telling you we can predict everything about the future indefinitely. I'm telling you we can do better than you thought. So why don't we talk about the technology in context, right? I guess this is another level setting moment where we can talk about right. the thesis of the book and what you're actually talking about to begin with. But um, yeah, what's, what's sort of the elevator pitch here? So I've been around futurism and futurists and science fiction for a long time. And a technology that people have for many, many decades foreseen and tried to discuss is something called brain emulation. It is a route to human level artificial intelligence that's different from the main route that's been taken for the last few decades. Uh, recently, what we've done is try to write algorithms and computer software that achieves things that humans can do. Instead, in this context, we're just going to take a particular human brain and make a model of it. So we know humans have human level intelligence. We know humans have a computer in their head, which is their brain. And the idea is if we just figure out how that computer works at a small scale level well enough, then you can just make a copy that works the same. And then that will be a human level artificial machine. So in your brain are cells, and the cells send each other signals, and they send them through axons, like connections between the cells. And so when somebody hits you on the back and your mouth yells, then there's this whole path of signals come on your back, signals go up to your brain, they go through all sorts of one signal sent to a cell, sent to another cell, et cetera, and then eventually it sends a signal to your mouth, and then you yell. Right. That's how your brain works. So. It's all captured in these local dependencies where, say, one cell gets some signals in, changes some internal state, and sends some signals out. If you can find out how to model each cell and how it does that, put it all together, you've got to model the whole thing. So the concept of a brain emulation is you take a particular human brain and you scan it to see where all the cells are connected to what, including what type each cell is. And then you need a computer model of how each type of cell takes signals in, changes states, sends signals out. You have good enough models for all the cells. You have a good enough scan of the whole brain. Then kind of by definition, if we put this whole thing together, 
it will have the same input output behavior as you. So we poke it in the back and it yells, okay? And if we do a good enough job, it would do exactly the same things you would in the same situation. And that's what a rain emulation is. And so I can postulate eventually this would be possible. Eventually this will be cheap. And then I can say, how will the world change if this were cheap? And the key point is it will act just like you would. So we know a lot about it. This isn't some strange alien creature. We know a lot about humans and how they respond to circumstances. So we can use all that to predict how these things behave. These things will behave different than humans only because they live in a different world. But we already have ways to reason about how humans live and behave differently when they're in different worlds. And so we use all of that to predict how these things behave. So without, I mean, saying exactly when brain emulation might happen, it does seem like the, the very premise of the book sort of deals with these competing timelines, right? One where we engineer intelligence or engineer something that can, um, and or, or we replicate our own intelligence and can kind of wield it digitally. That being said, you're like, you seem, at least as far as I can tell, pretty skeptical of any kind of intelligence explosion or AGI killing us all. Um, why do you think that brain emulation might happen before we reach any kind of AGI? So first of all, just notice that there are many different future scenarios. Of course. And we should just analyze a lot of them. Mm. And you might say, is it worth having 100 books in the future? And you might say, well, yeah, then it would be worth having a book on a scenario that had a 1% chance, right? So the threshold here is low for mm. justifying the book. I don't need to have a high confidence that this particular scenario plays out to me, this be worth doing because we should just have books on a whole bunch of different scenarios, right? So I would say this meets that standard. Now, uh, so what exactly is the standard here where you want to say, look, um, there are many ways we could create human level artificial intelligence. And this is one way. Now, if we achieve human level artificial intelligence some other way, then there's the question of when this finally becomes possible, how much do people want to pay humans anyway? Like, so this is most directly a substitute for humans. Right. Humans initially do jobs and now these brain emulations can do the jobs. If humans are no longer doing any jobs, <laughs> then the brain emulations may also not find very much demand. It, it's, although it's possible because they're cheaper. Mm. So if, let's think about all the different things humans do. For each one of them, we could also imagine, you can say how expensive it is to get a human to do that. And we imagine how expensive it would be to get a machine to do that, right? So clearly for pretty much all the things humans are doing now, it's more expensive to have a machine do that than it is the human doing it, because that's what we're doing. Mm. But it might be close on some of them, right? And then over time, as computers get cheaper compared to humans, then we switch on some of them. We, now we have a machine do it because a human is too expensive, right? And so when we get to the possibility of making brain emulations, uh, there'll be a sudden, say, decline in the cost of using an emulation compared to humans. So it might switch back at a point. We might say, have a human doing something and now have, have a regular AI do it. But now when the AMs AM show up, you can say, oh, let's have that do it because it's cheaper, right? But still the fundamental thing is, if we're at a point in time where humans are just much more expensive, way to do anything than machines are, then the emulations just may not be very tempting. So fine, we, they're cheaper, but they're still not enough cheaper, right? So in order to make the age of M a plausible analysis, we'll want to be considering scenarios or at least there are at least many humans still working mm. at the time when the M show up. And I think I can see a lot of probability for a lot of scenarios like that. I don't need to think they're be very confident. I just need to think there's a substantial chance that when this technology shows up, there'll still be a lot of things humans are doing. So now, basically how fast will other kinds of machines do jobs? In the past, we've had a relatively steady replacement. So over the last century or two, we've had a relatively steady rate at which humans doing a task are replaced by machines doing the task. So it's such a slow rate of replacement that most people can predict their careers decades in advance without needing to worry about this. Sometimes they're surprised, but not usually, right? So in fact, I did a study uh, from 1999 to 2019 of automation of jobs over that time. And I could we have a data set on how automated each of 900 jobs in the US was over that time period. And then we could look at 
basically the fact that jobs got somewhat more automated over that period, like basically a third of a standard deviation, I think, in the distribution of automation over the 20 year period. Uh, but the things that predicted which jobs get auto or how automated were pretty much the same over that same 20 year period. There was no substantial change in the nature of which things are automated. And when jobs got more automated, they didn't actually, people doing those things didn't lose their jobs more or change their wages more. We saw no effect on number of workers or wages for this. So in the last few centuries, we have this relatively steady trend, right? So if that trend in the past two centuries continues, then we've got several centuries to go before all the jobs are automated. In which case, we've got several centuries for brain emulations to show up. Now you could postulate and say, ah, but past trends won't necessarily continue. We might have a sudden burst of automation in the near future, where all of a sudden a lot of jobs get automated really fast, mm -hmm. and in fact, they all get automated. At which point then brain emulations would no longer be as interesting, right? So it seems to me sufficient just to say, look, we have a pretty steady trend here for centuries. We've got no particular good reason to think that sudden deviation will happen. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me it's well worth doing the analysis of the age of M book. Um, so that's addressing whether the age of M book is worth doing in the context of accelerating sure. the possibility of accelerating automation. Now, there's a separate question of, are we risking extermination? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> by allowing the possibility of a jump in accelerating automation, that's a right. whole separate issue, right? We could talk about that if you want, but I that's mean, a, you see how that's a different yeah, it, It's a totally different thing, but I mean, yeah, again, I'm curious, right? It seems like there's sort of this set of assumptions, um, as far as I understand your argument, there's sort of the set of assumptions that, um, you know, AI has to, first of all, become sentient, decide it wants to destroy humanity, and then uh, we have to notice or not notice that it's going about doing those steps for any of this to even happen in the first place, more or less. Well, in general, what you have is a set of people making a claim, and then other people trying to pin them down on what exactly their claim is and what their assumptions are, and they're being a bit evasive. So um, you know, one of the people in the space was a man named Eliezer Yukowski, who I had shared a blog with for many years. So we had a debate you know, 15 years ago. And in that contest, context, he was making certain assumptions as the basis for his claims. So with respect to those assumptions, that would be the kind of response you were just discussing in terms of the particular scenario we had in mind and what would be required for that scenario. But then recently people say, oh, that's not, I don't need to make those assumptions. And then you try to probe and say, well, what are you assuming? And then people kind of want to just say, well, look, if AI is just more powerful than us and can do things out of our control, that's by itself the problem. And they don't want to talk about any other more specific scenarios. They just want to say, look, in principle, if AI is just more powerful than humans and smarter than humans and could possibly hurt us. That's it. That's, that's the whole problem. And they don't want to make any more claims than that. So now we just, so now we're just evaluating this pretty abstract sure. possibility that eventually AI could be more powerful than us. And I got to say, well, yeah, yeah, probably eventually AI will be more powerful than us. And then I want to say, and the problem is, <laughs> and I think the argument I mean, so I did some work trying to basically, I sort of scheduled conversations with about a dozen people in the space and had you know, hour long conversations with them, try to think about this. And as far as I can tell, the fundamental issue here is just what I'll call an othering. The AI is other. So if an other has power against us, then that's just, you know, the problem for many people, an other has power. Like once you define an us versus them, you don't want them to have powers over us. So you could do this US, China or whatever, any sort of division, right? You say the Chinese are growing, the Chinese might eventually be more richer than us and they could then dictate terms and that's unacceptable. So we have to find a way to prevent China from getting richer than us. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you just define it at that abstract level, any other gaining powers, then, um, you know, that's a pretty stark division. Now, sometimes that makes sense for a rival, but, I want to make the key distinction between a descendant and a rival. Like, so if you think about evolution, what kind of hostilities or allegiances would evolution give you? I think we can understand in many ways why you would have evolved a suspicion of rivals and a concern about rivals 
having power compared to you, having advantages over you and your allies. And this is just a general human thing, right? People have suspicion about other races and other all sorts of divisions. Um, but this sort of allegiance to an us versus a them is the sort of thing that evolution promotes in some contexts, but not all contexts. And in particular, it shouldn't promote that with respect to your descendants. <laughs> evolution pretty consistently wants you to promote your descendants, even if they're different from you, even as it wants you to resist and be suspicious of rivals that exist simultaneous to you, right? So for example, um, if you think about, does it make sense to have a hostility to the other gender? <laughs> you might think, oh, if, if the two genders are always going to be pretty equally matched, it doesn't really make that much sense evolutionarily to be hostile to the other gender, right? Uh, it might make sense to be hostile to another ethnicity, perhaps, because you know they have different genes for you. So um, it makes very little sense for you to be hostile to other generations <laughs> on an evolutionary basis, right? I mean, to fight for my generation over right, the next right, generation, right, right. well, evolution doesn't want you to do that, right? It wants you to promote your next generation. So fundamentally, if we're just going to go on the us them thing, then I think many people, that's the energy here. They are going, the AI looks like a them. It's made out of metal and it thinks different and it'll be over in those other buildings. And you know, it'll, it could just have different agendas than me. It's the other. And you're imagining the AI is the other. The point is, it's not here now. It doesn't exist now. It might be in the future, a descendant of yours. <laughs> it'll be something we cause and create as a descendant of ours if it comes to exist, it's not a coexisting rival. Like some people often make a comparison. Well, if we knew aliens were on the way and they're going to be here in a you know, hundred years, wouldn't we want to prepare for the aliens coming here? Well, yeah, but that would be a coexisting thing now that's coming here. Mm. Here we're talking about our descendants and our descendants are things we should want to promote. Now, I, I especially want to push on what did you think was going to happen without AI? How did you think the future was going to go? So I'm going to tell you how you already were assuming the future was going to go. You assumed that your descendants were going to differ from you and eventually they would be more powerful than you and that they could choose their own way in defiance of your instructions. That's what you already were assuming about your descendants. In fact, because that's how you treat your ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of know that your ancestors should have expected that eventually you would be around here and you would be more powerful than them and you would be allowed to choose a different agenda from them. And then if you and they had a conflict, you might win that conflict. That's just the nature of succeeding generations. And that you might be pretty different from them. And you are. And that's what you should expect about your descendants, right? So in some sense, all the complaints about AI are mainly the complaints you could have already had about your ordinary descendants. What if they're different from me? What if they have an agenda different from me? What if I have a conflict with them? Yeah, that's the, the nature of succeeding generations all through history. That's, that's evolution. So that in mind, right, that succeeding generations always have, you know, over time, very different sets of values, what they hold in high regard. I mean, you know, if kids get tattoos, you know, maybe their right. parents yell at them. What can you be sure of about the descendants of humans? What can we be sure of? Well, the most robust long-term trend we've seen is increasing capacity, right? Uh, our civilization has become increasingly capable in a wide range of ways. Um, we can be less sure about increasing capacity per individual. So that's been a trend in the last few centuries, but only the last few centuries. And that's only a consequence of the growth rate in the economy being faster than the growth rate in population, which is not a robust thing to expect in the future. So I, you shouldn't expect rising per capita wealth or income, but you should expect total income or total wealth to be increasing. So you expect our descendants to just get more capable. Mm -hmm. You should certainly also expect them to just get weirder compared to our distant ancestors. Like there's an accumulation of difference that will just keep being more different. What else should you expect? Well, the question is whether the world will coordinate at a global scale. So we discussed before about whether the world would be so coordinated at a global scale that we wouldn't want to allow colonists to leave in order to maintain this global coordination. So that's a key decision point. And that's, in a sense, the do we become gravity decision point, which I think is maybe the most important decision we'll ever make. Do we allow our descendants to expand into the universe and go separate ways and then have conflicts with each other 
and no longer have some unified discussion about how to do everything, but fight it out basically? Or do we stay and coordinate together and discuss things together? So if we don't stay together, if we allow ourselves to spread out, then I can make some other robust predictions. I can predict that you know, our descendants will be locally competitive. In their local world, they will be doing roughly the best they can to promote their reproduction. And in fact, I would make the further prediction that uh, likely our descendants will have the conscious direct awareness that what they want at the fundamental level is to reproduce. This isn't what you or I have. So evolution created us in order to reproduce. That was the process that produced us. But as a guide to our behavior, it gave us these structures in our head that tell us what we want. And those structures are a mess. They're, they're all these amalgam of different instincts and habits and inclinations and temptations and desires that in the past did tend to make us reproduce, but now in our current world, not working so well to get us to reproduce. And in a long, sun, in a long run, that's just not such a robust strategy for getting creatures to reproduce. The most robust one would be to just have in their head their knowing that their goal is to reproduce. That would work really well. So that's what I predict. Eventually our descendants will just be creatures who know that's what they want. They won't be unsure what they want like we are. We're actually pretty confused about what we want because we're this amalgam of different things and at different times they pull on us in different ways and we can't even predict that. We don't know what we want. They'll know what they want. That's one prediction. Another prediction is they will no longer discount the future as much as we do. Mm -hmm. So we understand actually a lot about why we discount the future because in natural selection at the moment, our children tend to have half as many genes as we do, at least compared to our reference point. And so uh, we tend to have a discount rate of the future of roughly a factor of two per generation. We can either spend money on ourselves now or on our children a generation later. And therefore, but since they only have half our genes, that's only worth half as much. So we now discount the future. And this is a big reason why we are neglecting the future. But for asexually selected creatures, we, we have a lot of analysis that says they won't discount the future. Mm. And so they would discount risk in a certain way, actually in a logarithmic way. So we understand why evolution would produce risk aversion, but that's different than discounting the future. And so we can see how our, creature, our descendants would probably not discount the future, which means there'll come a point where people actually think about the long run future and actually take actions based on that. And suddenly we will no longer have the problem of risking doing terrible things to ourselves because we're just not thinking about the future. So that's basically a reasonable complaint people have right now. People who think about the future say, look, there's these things coming and they could be really bad, but you're hardly doing anything about it. You're, you can't even pay attention to this. You can't be moved even to care about something that happens a little bit in the future. And um, isn't this like, like we're, we're driving fast through the dark yeah. landscape blind? Shouldn't we like turn on some headlights and look ahead, right? But so in the future, we will eventually, we'll turn on the headlights, we will look ahead because we will care about the future. So, I mean, we're, we're sort of still in the topic of, of values and future generations and, and sort of how we change, how we think about things. I wanna bring this back to a point you were sort of briefly touching on in the age of M. So, I mean, like huge implications here, right? Like suppose we have a, a, a thousand Robin Hansons working away in cyberspace. Um, in, in your mind, does this change how we constitute consciousness, how we constitute life, what constitutes death. Um, I mean, presumably if you're toiling away in cyberspace and you're finished whatever, whatever work it was that you were supposed to do, does ending a process like that constitute the end of a life? So you mentioned life and death and consciousness. Consciousness is the sort of thing it's really hard to say much about because in a literal sense, we know almost nothing yeah, about fair it. Fair enough. Okay. So just, just life forget, death, we, forget know a lot consciousness. About. we know a lot about life and death. Yeah. So in the age of M, I analyze how they will change attitudes toward life and death. So the, the key point in the age of M is this is a competitive world. So this is a world where there are many different clans of, of individuals, many different companies, cities who are competing with each other. And so, and they're also pretty poor. This is a world of uh, subsistence wealth. And so the uh, competitive assumption works well for a poor world where many things are competing. So I basically analyze changes in terms of competition. I say, what would be the most competitive stance? And I can do that about life and death as well. Mm. So for example, um, 
Writing emulations can make copies of themselves relatively easy, but you know, how often should they? Well, there's, there's one strategy that's pretty attractive, which is uh, we need rest, right? We, we need rest at the end of the day, on the weekend, even coffee breaks during the day, and that makes us more productive. So, um, you know, an ordinary human life, you're working during the day, and then you rest at night, and then you start working the next day. But there's an attraction for an M, which is to, at the beginning of the workday, make many copies of the well-rested M, have them work for a workday, and then only have a few copies go on to the next day, because then you don't have to pay so much for their rest between the days. And I call these stubs, that is, these short-term copies that don't last very long stubs. So there's going to be a very strong competitive temptation to, you know, at the beginning of the day, make many copies who work through the day, and then have one or just a few copies who go on to the next day. So that's a way in which, now these short-term copies at the end of the day, they could say to themselves, I'm about to die. At the beginning of the day, they could say, I only have a few hours to live, this is terrible, right? They could have a very death-averse attitude toward that stance, in which case they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't let themselves do it. But then they'd be outcompeted by the ones who are more blasé about it, who think, no, this is just me continuing another way. So I predict with some confidence that the most common ends will be blasé about this. They won't see a stub as dying. They will just see it as another part of themselves they don't remember as well. So an analogy might be, let's say you go to a party where you take a drug at the beginning of the party. That means you don't remember that party the next day. I hear some people do this. Like sometimes people go to parties and they don't remember it the next day. Now, toward the end of this party, do you say to yourself, I'm about to die. I became the separate person at the beginning of the party. And now this other person tomorrow, they won't remember me. So that's not me. I'm about to die. I hate this, right? You could think that, but you probably don't. You probably do think, I will continue tomorrow. I just won't remember what I did here tonight. But now you're identifying with that future person. So that's the same way for these steps. They could also see their other selves the same way. They could say, well, there was this mainline copy. It'll go on to the next eye. That's me. I'm the sideline. I will end now, but uh, the larger eye will continue. I predict they will have that attitude, not because it's philosophically correct, it's just the, the attitude that makes them more competitive in this world. So I can use that sort of analysis to make many predictions about their attitudes toward life and death. And so basically, with respect to short-term copies, they're much more blasé about that. They don't see that as death. They see that as a part of themselves they don't remember so well. But you already know there's many parts of your life you don't remember so well, right? Are those parts of you dead? You could think of them that way, but you don't. And they're probably functional, right? So that's the story here, is to analyze what attitudes toward life and death would succeed in the, under competitive pressures. And I can say a lot about that in this world. I think that, you know, when we're talking about any of this, it's at the end of the day, I'm curious how you think about time scales, because whether we're talking about brain emulation in the age of M, or whether we're talking about artificial general intelligence, the implications of being able to make a million copies of you working away on some task or some kind of intelligence explosion, whether or not we believe in that, it's actually kind of a microscopic study because so much happens so quickly. How do you think about economic inequality for anybody who isn't an immediate adopter of the age of M or of the AGI? Well, so in this scenario, we can track many kinds of inequality and see what they happen. So again, remember the basic starting analysis framework is I'm trying to predict what's likely to happen, mm. whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Once we figure out the baseline scenario, then we can ask, what do we like? What don't we like? And then we could try to think about how to influence the scenario and move it a bit, knowing that it's probably hard to move it a lot. Mm. So that's why it's good to find the baseline scenario. So all of these things in my book are about what I guess would happen. Now, when I look at the whole book, I think that's not such a bad world. It's pretty different than our world. It's not so bad, but other people go, oh, that's hell, that's terrible. So those people should be more motivated to figure out how to change it, perhaps, or to prevent it if they just think no version is any good. Uh, so that's a prelude to saying, I'm about to tell you about inequality. I'm not recommending this per se, but it might be hard to change. Let's figure it out. Okay, so the, the, the first thing to say is the age of M is full of brain emulations of humans, but it's a very competitive world. So it's going to be make lots of copies of the humans who are most competitive in this world. It can make billions or even trillions of copies of any one human easily. So it doesn't need to have equal representation from all the humans in the world. In fact, my estimate is that 
it really only needs the few hundred best humans and then make a lot of variations on those and it doesn't really need the rest of the humans. <laughs> so most brain emulations are copies of the few hundred humans who are most suited for this world and all the other currently 8 billion minus a few hundred humans, this world doesn't have much demand for them. Now, those humans initially start off with wealth. Most humans are most wealth, most wealth in our world, right? And in the early age of Adam period, humans will still own most of the wealth in the world. So they could pay to have a copy of themselves as an M. They could basically convert to be an M and then retire as an M and then live off their wealth as an M. And they could live quite comfortably. But that's not the M world demanding them or you know, wanting to hire them for jobs. That's them paying for themselves to exist. So this is an enormous inequality, clearly, <laughs> of you know, how many copies of any one human there is in this world. Basically, for most humans, there's just as many copies in this world as they can afford to pay for, you know, maybe a dozen or who knows, depending on how cheaply they live. And then for a few hundred humans, there are billions of copies of those because the M world really likes them and has a lot of spots for them. So there's an enormous inequality in that transition. Now, there's other kinds of inequality we can think about in this world. Um, remember, most of this world is living at subsistence level. So now, they don't actually have that much income inequality mm. because uh, basically if something is in more demand, they just make more copies of it, but they basically are at near subsistence income. So there's relatively little income inequality in this world, but there is enormous inequality in the number of copies of any one person. So, but in our world, we honestly oddly don't talk about that kind of inequality. When we talk about inequality, we don't say, well, well, your grandpa, how many descendants do they have? And my grandpa, how many descendants do we have? And you know, I should be jealous of you if your grandpa had more descendants. We, we never even mentioned that as a kinds of inequality we're concerned about in our world. So the kind of inequality there'd be a lot of in the M world is the kind of inequality we haven't been very concerned about. Maybe we should, but that's part of the problem with understanding the M world. Now, there's probably gonna be more wealth inequality because of immortality. So in our world, one of the things that limits wealth inequality is that rich people die. If everybody, of all the rich people in the world, just kept on living indefinitely, they could continue to accumulate their wealth and inequality would get larger than it is now. And so it'll be more like that for M's. That is, because they will be basically immortal, they will continue to accumulate wealth indefinitely and therefore have more wealth inequality. So whether it's aliens or M's or AI or anything that we're talking about here, these are all like very existential questions. And I'm curious for you specifically, like, how do you think about theology and, and just life in general? I know you're a big proponent of, or we're a big proponent of cryonics and all this interesting stuff and life at all costs. What's the personal philosophy I mean, there? So clearly, in my mind, a bigger question is just more interesting and worth investigating, right? So clearly, I'm looking at big questions. Yeah. And if there's more at stake in a question or topic, I'm just drawing that. Um, so it's, and it, I'm, I am analyzing these, I think, in very straightforward terms. We're, you know, I'm not disagreeing with other people so much about life versus death being important or knowing the truth being important or, you know, all these sorts of things. So in a sense, sense I'm, I'm being very straightforward with my methods and my priorities on unusual topics, uh, which I think is, is great. That is, I, 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 I would much rather, if I'm going to be weird on something, be weird on, on the topic as opposed to my methods or priorities, because then if I can convince you the topic's important, I can convince you my work is important, and then I don't have to worry about why am I doing something weird? I must be wrong about something, right? I have some enough research on the rationality of disagreement, and so you should always be worried that when you disagree with people, it's because you're wrong and they're right. <laughs> and all of your extra effort into something because you think it's special, it's not so special, and you're just you know, wasting your time. So you should worry about that when you're doing something weird. Is Am I wasting my time because this is not as important or interesting as it seems? So I'm more comfortable with being, if I can convince you later, oh, of course that was important, and yes, I'm, that's the win, then that was something I should have worked on. Um, in the last year, I picked the topic, the study of the sacred. So in a certain sense, it's been in my way is <laughs> when I try to study other things, people tell me that I shouldn't do that or I shouldn't try to do things because I'm you know, messing with the sacred. You need to find God. And so right. I find a side, let's figure this thing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's make this my topic. Let me focus on it, 
collect the evidence, study it, mm -hmm. see what people say, and I will figure this thing out and understand it. And I think I do understand it better now. So in a sense, I can tell you what the sacred is and why it's there. And then I can help use that to think about, you know, how that should change my mind about the various topics I study. Uh, and so in some sense, this should be, you know, the most straightforward strategy you could imagine. <laughs> if you say, you look, you're, you might say, look, you're doing all these big things, but you're not talking about it in a very sacred way, Robin. Well, what is it about that? How, do, you, do you not like the sacred? Do you not think anything sacred? Because that might be the, the tone of your, your question here, Robin. You're doing all these big things, but how come you're not talking about it in the way people would talk about big things? Because mm -hmm. they would talk about really big, important things in a sort of other way, right? They'd be reverential. And, sure, sure, for sure. And sort of general, and they would, you know, pause, and they would look deep in your eyes and talk about their emotions. And but that, so your, I'm not doing that. To but, your point earlier, I mean, it, God just seems like the elephant in the room here, right? So the sacred gets me a long way to God. Um, so my analysis, uh, theoretical analysis starts with this guy named Durkheim, who was a founder of the field of sociology, uh, wrote about it a little over a century ago. Mm -hmm. His story, which I think is roughly right, is that the fundamental thing in religion is the sacred. That is, Religion is a way the sacred comes out, but it's not the only way the sacred comes out in our life. It's the thing that's really going on. And religion is just a thing we do to deal with the sacred. And, which, and then God is a thing that religion does. So in some sense, we could talk about God, but we might talk about religion causing God, or we might talk about the sacred causing religion. So sure. in some sense, I'm going more fundamental here, talking about the sacred, right? Because that's the core. That's, that's, that's where all these other things come from. Okay. So then... Again, the challenge is, what is the sacred? So Durkheim said, the sacred is groups of people wanting to bond together and having the strategy of bonding together over a thing they see the same as sacred. So the key idea might be, say you're, you and I are a group of people, we're a team and we're gonna go fight those guys and we're gonna be loyal to each other. But there's gonna be times which I betray you, you betray me, we have all these things that could break us up, right? And the idea is, if all we are is loyal to each other, we are more easily broken up than if we love the sacred tree, okay? If nobody else gets why that's the sacred tree, but you get it and I get it, that bonds us together. Mm. And the more we really understand each other as you and I see the tree is sacred and you, we and I get it, nobody else gets that, that bonds us together in a way that will overcome your betraying me sometimes. <laughs> You betray me, but you're the only one who gets the sacred tree, <laughs> right. okay? And that's really important. The tree is really important. Right. And so you're really important, even if you betray me, because the tree is really important and you and I see it the same. That's the idea, that groups of people can be bonded more deeply and strongly together by a shared view of something sacred. So this is the elephant in the brain in the way, right? Like religion being less about God, more about right. social cohesion. Right, exactly. Okay. And we have a chapter on religion in the, in the book, of yeah. course. But this is the key idea of the sacred, but this is more general than God. Mm. So once you, so what I did for my analysis is I collected 68 correlates that people said tend to go along with sacred. And so then the strategy is to explain these correlates, to make sense of why all these things correlate with each other. Can you give an example of like a correlate? Sure, so I bundle the correlates together into seven themes and I can describe those themes. So one thing is we value the sacred. There are many ways we value the sacred. We sacrifice for it, etc. Another is that we want to show that we value the sacred, not just value, we want to show each other we value the sacred. A third is that we bind together via our shared sense of the sacred. But in addition, so those are three, we've got four more. One is that we tend to want to separate the sacred from other things. We want to have a clear distinction between sacred and profane things and not mix them up and not put them together. Another is that we idealize the sacred. Sacred things are more perfect, less, less flawed. Uh, they are just better in many ways. Uh, and then we have this norm of feeling and not thinking the sacred, not calculating the sacred. On sacred topics, we are to sort of just feel it and emotionally get it mm. without calculating it. Mm. And so that's another norm of the sacred. And the last one is that often sacred things are kind of abstract. And then we have concrete things that are connected to that sound. And those things are very sacred that are concrete. True. Or so, for example, our love can be sacred in a love letter. Or the nation can be sacred in a flag or, or, or a memorial or something, right? So 
we often have very concrete things that become sacred as a connection to the abstract. So these are main correlates of the sacred. And the challenge is to understand these correlates, to have a theory that predicts them. So Durkheim has the story that the fundamental thing is to bind people together, which makes sense. But the question is, how do we explain these correlates with that? Why, because we're binding together, do we idealize it? Do we want to separate it? Do we not want to think about it? And does con concrete things become sacred by connection? So my contribution would be to explain those things, how it is that those follow from the fact that we see it the same. And the key uh, thing I, I use there is something called construal level theory, which is a, an account in psychology. Construal level theory is about how some things are far and versus near to us, and we think about things far differently than near. So if you see a view of a scene, you will see a small number of things up close in a lot of detail and a large number of things far away with very little detail. And the idea is that in your mind, the things that are far away are described very sparsely. So you're thinking about them abstractly. Whereas things up close, you're seeing in great detail and you're thinking about them concretely. But we have near versus far, not just in space, but also in time, in social distance, hypotheticality that is a hypothesis or scenario that's very unlikely is far, whereas one that's likely is near, and in planning. So in planning, we have high level goals, which are abstract and far, and we have near level constraints and practical choices, which are uh, concrete. And so we have this near versus far as something that's true all through our mental reasoning. And we know a bunch of things about near versus far. In particular, any one near element tends to invoke an assumption of other near things or far. So when I think about something far in time, I tend to assume it's far in space and far in social distance and far in hypotheticality. And so we know a bunch of things about how near versus far interact in the way we think. And here's the key observation. Let's say we treat medicine as sacred, which we do in our society. Medicine is sacred. And we want to bind together by seeing it the same. So now let's imagine you have a medical problem. I don't. Mm. You are going to see your medical problem up close because you're near to it. I will see your medical problem from far away, and I will then see it different than you. And that's an obstacle to our seeing it the same. So the key idea is we, sacred things are things we see the same in order to bind together. But when we see things differently, when we are near versus far to them, that's an obstacle to seeing it the same. And so the key hypothesis is that for sacred things, we have the unusual mental strategy of seeing it from afar, even when it's close. So people often are reluctant to look at the details of their medicine, and they will just accept the general description of it and the general advice of their doctors or friends and not be willing to look at the details so mm -hmm. well. Similarly, when I think of, say, love versus sex, sex is nearer. And people who are closer to sex versus far away do see it differently, mm. right? It, when you are close to sex, you have a whole bunch of different thoughts and feelings about it, which are quite distinct from people who are far away from it. And you may well disagree with people who are far away from it about how you should treat it, right? Whereas love we see as more abstract, more idealized, more sacred, and more the same. So people often in a relationship for a long time, they're not sure they're in love. They don't know if they're in love because it's this abstract thing. They don't know how to connect to the concrete things around them. But this allows us to agree on love. So we are all in strong agreement that love is a good thing, even though we're not sure exactly what it is or how it applies to any one situation. That's an example of seeing love from afar in order to see it the same. So that's the key thesis here that I've come to understand. We can understand all of these correlates of the sacred by postulating not only that we primarily see things the same in order to bind together as sacred, but that we see them from afar when we can in order to better see them the same and to better treat them as sacred. Now, seeing from afar has costs. That is, when you see things up close and you recognize all their details, there's a lot of detail you can take into account in making good decisions about them. So there's a cost to not seeing those details. You don't make as good decisions about those things. So we make bad decisions about medicine. And that's part of the contribution to our, in fact, getting more medicine, not being more helpful because we are seeing medicine as sacred, but we are getting the benefit of seeing it the same. We do more agree that we all think medicine is good, even though we're not so sure exactly in any one case what the right thing to do is, 
we more agree on it because we see it from afar. Right? And so this is, I can say, a thing I've come to understand about the sacred. And I can tell you some simple things. We all treat some things as sacred. Mm. I do, you do. It's not something you're going to be able to get rid of. Mm. At best, you can change which things you see as sacred and how, perhaps, but you're not going to be able to get rid of the whole category. So I think each of us has to ask, what will I choose to treat as sacred? And I'm going to be having to pay this cost of not seeing it as clearly and getting the benefit of agreeing with other people about how I see it. And you know, I've thought a bit about what are the things I will still agree to treat as sacred. And, you know, in this whole context of all these things I care about. Um, honestly, I have to say math works pretty well because math is a thing that is hard to distort by seeing it from afar. Mm. And math is actually idealized. It is actually separated. There's many ways in which math is actually the kind of features that we make sacred things into. Uh, and so I'll put math on my mix of things I'm willing to treat as sacred because they, it's less distorted by that. It, it's more robust. It, it's, it stands up well mm. being treated as sacred. Then truth is something that I'm going to be treating as sacred. It makes sense for a, a scholar or a thinker to treat truth as sacred. And I'm in a community of many people who already do treat truth as sacred. And I can see how that pays its cost. That I can see that somebody might offer to pay me to lie or distort something and I probably should consider those more than I do. <laughs> as a practical matter, maybe it would be better to do that. And as, a, sure. as an actual matter, I more resist even considering it because I treat it as sacred. Yeah. And I can see there are costs there, but I can see how there might be benefits too to having a group of people who just consistently reject such temptations because now you can trust them more. And I can see an advantage of treating truth as sacred. Mm. Although many people like have only that for some kind of truths. And then the question is how for how many topics is truth sacred, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to be for a wider range of topics. So for me, I want to know about the elephant in the brain, even if it's going to hurt my personal interactions, because truth is priority there, and I'm paying a price, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the examples of paying a price to treat something as sacred. I'm going to stick my head into more places it doesn't belong <laughs> because of this treating truth as sacred. Yeah. And then I guess in my sense of the future, I kind of treat just long-term potential is sacred. So there's a sense in which long -term, our long-term descendant potential, it's a very far thing. It's hard to see up close, clearly. It's abstract. Uh, it's pretty separate from ordinary f personal concerns. It's idealized in principle, right? So it works in many ways as a sacred thing. And it's something I do care a lot about. And there are many other people who seem to care about it too. So. Yeah, it works. So these are my three sacred things I'll offer now. Math, truth, potential. Robin, we're coming up on time, so I have two more for you. Okay. And the first is actually pretty straightforward, which is what's the most surprising thing you've learned recently? Recently? Uh, how recent? <laughs> I don't know, whatever recent means to you. Well, like in the last two days, <laughs> I came across a 2001 paper that says bad is stronger than good. And I just hadn't thought much about that. Mm. And I wrote a blog post about it yesterday and I still think it's worth thinking about. So the key idea is that bad events, bad characteristics, bad features, they just weigh on us more carefully than good. Mm. We care more about them than bad things. But when we define ourselves and our own goals and plans, we tend to neglect them. We tend to define ourselves and our, and our friends and other things in terms of good features, but the bad ones matter more for our actions and our choices and our beliefs. So we're somewhat in denial about the fact that we care more about bad than good. We more want to avoid bad than to achieve good. That's just a robust fact. And it makes sense that is there's a certain way in which any complicated thing, a whole, whole bunch of little things can break it and cause a lot more damage. And it's hard to make it better, much harder to make it better by doing something than to make it worse by breaking it. So there's a sense in which it makes complete sense for us to care more about the bad than the good in a great many ways, but we're in somewhat in denial about this. So I thought, oh, so I should try to think about how can I define what I care about and what I want and even myself more in terms of bads than goods. 
and maybe even the people around me. And I can feel the challenge. People, there's a strong norm. No, you should focus on the goods. It's, it's bad people focus on bad things, right? Mean bad people are always talking about bad things. Like you, hate is a bad thing, right? You should, we all hate hate. We don't hate the haters because haters <laughs> hate things, right? And, and good people love things. And good people talk about the things they love and not about the things they hate. But this says, no, everybody, folk, everybody really cares more about the things they hate than the things they love. And I should own up to that. And so I'm struggling to do that. So that's a surprise in the last two days. If you want a longer time scale, I guess we could find other surprises. I've got one more for you. And it's the same one I ask everyone at the end of any conversation, which is inside or outside the scope of anything we've talked about today. What should more people be thinking about? What should more people be thinking about? Um, institutional innovation. So the world gets better because of innovation. Most innovation that people are aware of and, and think about is tech innovation, innovation in physical arrangements or software, but we can also have innovation in our social arrangements. That's social innovation, institutional innovation. The major obstacle for institutional innovation is that we just don't try enough things. So there's a world of academics and idea thinkers who've come up with ideas for better institutions, but the ideas just sit there because nobody tries them. There's also a world of people who would love to advocate for an institution on, on a, in a protest or some political movement, except they only want to advocate for things as other people have already tested. So there's the missing in the middle, people who take the ideas that academics have generated for institutions and just try them enough so that somebody could advocate for them as a, as a loud you know, activist. But hardly anybody wants to do that. Hardly anybody feels much motive or energy at just trying out institution ideas. They want to either write academic papers where they abstractly talk about institution ideas on the one end, or on the other end, they want to advocate for things that have been tried out. But in order to add to the pool of things that you could advocate for, you need to try them. And there's a lot of good ideas to try because people have been making lots of papers and, and blog posts, et cetera, describing lots of ideas that are worth trying. People don't want to try in the middle. That's the thing more people should think about. Take some interesting institution ideas and just try them. Robin, that's all I got for you. Thank you so much for doing it's it. It's great to talk. It's been wonderful. Appreciate it.